Hello and welcome to Your New Jersey. I'm Lisa Marie Falvo. On today's show, we'll learn all about the Connie Dwyer Breast Cancer Foundation and their annual Embrace Hope Gala. But first, from World Series champion to world-class food, Charlie Wanzowitz took his New York Yankees career to the kitchen. He and his wife Leslie recently opened W's Village Grill in Waldwick, and Charlie is here to tell us more. Charlie, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having us. Well, I am a diehard Yankee fan, so I cannot wait to dive into that part of your journey. But let's talk about this exciting yes. new venture happening in Woolwick. You're in your beautiful restaurant right now. How did it all come to be? After my baseball career, we kind of figured out, you know, what's the next move? So my wife suggested, she goes, why don't we look for some space? Uh, I'm a third generation restaurant owner now. So I was familiar growing up around the business, but never really running the business myself, obviously. I've been on a baseball field since I'm five years old, and I would. It's safe to say that when my contract ended in 2013, we had other options to stay in the game. But at that point, uh, I'm a believer everything has a shelf life, and I was truly exhausted from traveling and living out of a suitcase for 20 years. So we made the decision to walk away and try our hand at you know, what my family's been doing for a long time. What restaurants did your family own previous to you? My grandparents on my dad's side uh, had one of the biggest restaurants in Staten Island while I was, you know, basically a toddler and growing up. Um, it was called Charlie and Elle's Pine Room. Um, so they had that through the 60s into the early 70s until my grandfather passed away. And then my parents stepped in, took over the business, and kind of just started from there. How did that location on Staten Island influence where you are today? Where I am today is strictly because I fell in love with a beautiful woman who resides up in North Jersey. You know, when we started to date and realized it was going to continue into marriage and that kind of stuff, it was a smart move because I was always on the road. So we had to move up uh, close to her family and her parents. So she had support raising at the time, which would be my two older kids who are now older, speaking of time flying by. But uh, the only thing I knew about North Jersey growing up in Staten Island was that the GW Bridge took me to Yankee Stadium. Well, so it was fortuitous that you fell in love with somebody that lived in that portion of the Garden State because it made commuting to work a little bit easier. Although the Deegan, I mean, no matter what time of day is, is tricky. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, the traffic around here is constant. Um, the only benefit I had throughout my career was I've worked crazy hours. So my commute time in and my commute time back home basically for the most part was a smooth ride and the crazy hours set you up for the restaurant business because no other yeah. business has crazier hours than than food services so what does the restaurant feature we wanted to make it a neighborhood place uh kind of a one-stop shop for families you know my wife used to travel to me with my two little kids on the big holidays we had one incident many years ago we took the kids to a high-end restaurant and as soon as we walked in, people just stared my wife down like, oh, my God, these kids are going to sit next to us. And, you know, our dinner is going to be ruined without even, you know, just presumption. And we kind of made it through and they made some snide comments. And then the same people. And this is kind of what drove me is that when they were leaving, they came over and they said to my wife, can we just say your children were unbelievably behaved and this kind of stuff? So. I took that to when we got to where we are and told my wife, that's never going to happen again because every kid has curricular activity now. So at the end of a long day from the parents being on the field, whether it's any sport for 10 hours, somebody needs a place to go where they're not going to get looked at or so we kind of made it a kid friendly environment. And that's kind of where my plan started. I see a lot of wood. I definitely see a lot of jerseys with very prominent numbers. The place, the bones of the restaurant were set up. Um, it just, it needed an injection of new life, which is not uncommon 
when you're in this industry. So we set it up kind of the same way we set up our first restaurant from the floors to the booths to it's very kid friendly, but yet it's my wife and I, if we were going out, we can come here and sit at the bar and feel like we're not in the restaurant that the dining room is loaded with kids kind of is the best of both worlds. Uh, the menu reflects that we have some good features on our everyday menu, any kind of steak you want, you can get fish. Uh, we have a little kid's menu with the mutsy sticks and chicken tenders and little cheeseburgers and uh, that kind of stuff. But yet at the same time, um, we're satisfying the adults. We have specials every week. You know, most of the specials that we run at night are fish oriented, steak oriented. We like to throw in one home comfort food meal for the week. Do you have a favorite dish? I think my favorite dish is just a good old hamburger. You know, uh, my go-to is a bacon cheeseburger with cheddar cheese. And instead of fries, I'll really opt for onion rings. I wish I had one of those in front of me right now. That yeah. just sounds, sounds delightful. I mentioned the jerseys on the wall, and they're personally signed by the players. Correct. Run down who lent their autograph to the place. The memorabilia game is so intense and big right now. I was never really into that. Uh, I didn't collect to save and sell my merchandise and all that kind of stuff and until I started having, you know, my boys and they got old enough to fortunately come into the clubhouse and experience what their dad was experienced. But basically the jerseys on the wall, they're all personal friends of mine. So I have a personal connection with them. We still stay in contact with each other. Uh, and I'm proud of what I did for the extended period of time. And I wanted to create an environment where people kind of knew my background a little bit without making my restaurant a sports bar. We have about 10 or 11 jerseys up. Obviously, Mariano Rivera is front and center in the dining room. Um, Andy Pettit and Joe Torian next to each other. Don Manningly's up from when I first started. He's a very good friend of mine. Uh, Reggie Jackson. Um, who I became very close with over my years. Uh, Ron Guidry, who was my idol growing up as I played, started my career as a player, took it as far as I can, hurt my shoulder, pretty much injury ruins every aspiration of making it to the pros. But that is very special to me because, as I said, he was my idol growing up. And when you're in this business, it's kind of ironic that I grew up a Yankees fan coming from Staten Island. Ryan Guidry was my idol. The next thing I know, I'm working side by side with him and creating a relationship over the years. So much so that I pretty much talk to him a couple of times a month still. He spent weekends or, you know, several times he stayed over my house in Waldwick. So it, it just like this new venture is for me, a little bit of a whirlwind kind of my Yankee career was the same thing. I've been very fortunate, very blessed, uh, and very lucky, which I think luck and timing plays into a lot of success in people's lives. And uh, it's kind of happened to me, and, I, and I'm just very, very thankful. So you touched on how from Staten Island you got to the Yankees briefly, but what was that journey like? I mean, to land in the most storied franchise in all of sports. I graduated from Tottenville High School. I played for a legendary coach. At that time, going into high school, I knew I was very, I started to know that I was pretty good at what I did. Um, so I just continued that. Uh, college wasn't even a thought because back in the mid 80s, so I'm showing my age right now, it was, uh, it was hard. My parents both worked their tails off my whole life. So yeah, I saw my mom every day. My father was working two, three jobs, whatever he had to do to provide for us. Um, so when it came time, I really didn't know, except for the local colleges and, uh, you know, uh, the idea of going to school to play baseball didn't even enter my mind. So I was very fortunate again, when I finished my high school career that I started to get recruited. Um, 
by the local schools, pretty much every local school, some schools down south, some schools out west. So I had options and options that I didn't know about. So in the end, I chose to stay local because it was really the only school I knew of. And I knew of it because I was a huge basketball fan. And St. John's in the 80s, their basketball team was, you know, great. So, it, you know, as a little kid, you latched on to it and uh, recruited by St. John's, went up. Uh, actually, on my recruiting visit, one of my hosts was Chris Mullen, who is the all-time great basketball player. Uh, so as a kid from Staten Island, you're being recruited by St. John's, and the next thing you know, you're having dinner with Chris Mullen and standing next to him, and you're, okay, where do I sign, right? That's kind of the, the final question. So my journey took me from Staten Island to St. John's, where I proceeded to have my injury of my throwing shoulder, which kind of curtailed my career. Well, it didn't curtail it. It just, it, yeah, it did curtail it, but it was, uh, you know, my aspirations of making it to the next level kind of went out the window, which was okay. You know, I was at peace with myself. Uh, I made it that far in something I really knew nothing about. Um, got my degree, uh, graduated St. John's. And then from there, the whirlwind continued because a year and a half later, I was just trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Decided I was trying to get into coaching and stay in the game because I loved it. Was in the right place at the right time. Ran into somebody, a friend of mine who worked with the Yankees at the same time they were looking for someone like me. Went up for a tryout, two day tryout. I went up on a Monday, tried out. Tuesday, I tried out. And Wednesday, I was on the team charter going to the West Coast for 10 days after I signed a contract. And then continued just to progress. Got hired by Buck Showalter in 1993, his staff. Uh, he hired me, kept my mouth shut and my head down and just worked my tail off. And then just kept getting inviting back and kind of parlayed it into a 21-year career. And then you win yes. World Series. And then you keep winning them. And describe yes. what that must have felt like. It, it was crazy. You know, winning that first World Series was incredible. I just never felt anything like that in my life. And I was kind of a background guy then. And it was still a, an amazing feel. Uh, nothing replaces the feeling of winning. And winning in New York, like everybody talks about, is just incredible. Listen, we're, we're so excited to be in our new venture because this is our hometown. If somebody needs help and we can help them, we're there for them. Now being in our community, my two oldest ones are pretty much grown up now. So we really feel connected now with everything. Uh, and we're just looking forward to helping, you know, our town in every way and the surrounding towns, which we've done. I know the biggest transition is from that daily grind that you had with the Yankees, then going into the real world. And a lot of athletes, coaches, what have you, they struggle with that because they feel like they don't have a purpose, a focus. They were so used to the grind of the day to day in the sports world. And now to go into something corporate or entrepreneurship, it's like, what do I do? I'm out of my element. What is your advice to people that are facing that right now when you're in one place for so long no matter what business you are you kind of just focus on the task at hand right so you you kind of become a slave to your job and your environment so you block everything else out um i think the biggest thing i realized when i left the game is that i'm a pretty smart guy you know i had my degree uh from saint john's in business, uh, it was, but I never really used it because I was, uh, you know, in the sports world. So when we got out into what my wife likes to call the real world with the commoners, uh, <laughs> she would say to me, you know, our first year out, if we went on vacation and she would say, okay, she goes, you know, you have to get ready, ready to start living your life with the commoners. So when we go to the plane, you have to go through security you have to sit in a seat, a row with three seats. And, you know, she would just keep ribbing me. And it, it really is the truth. I mean, it's certainly an adjustment. Um, it's, it's a matter, I was very fortunate 
because again, well, two, twofold, I had to keep working, right? Three kids, you know, I, I'm not in a position to just ride off into the sunset after my, so it's a little easier for me. The athletes, the coaches, the other people that are involved when they finish and they do have that money in the bank where they can really do nothing. That's the issue. Um, they, they go from every day of their life, especially in sports, being told where to be, what time to be there to, okay, now I'm done. What do I do? And you see a lot of issues with, uh, money being spent, uh, recklessly. You see a lot of issues on the home front of not being able to adjust to family life, which was a huge adjustment for me year to year when my season ended. And I know it firsthand because we went, we all go through it. Well, everything you touch is a success. So I am sure it was hard, but it ended up obviously working out. So um, congratulations to you and everything that you've accomplished and you have much more to do. So for uh, our viewers out there, where can people find out more about you and the restaurant? My parents always said to me, just create the good product. If you create the good product and the good environment and you're very respectful to people and you treat them the way they're supposed to be treated, then they're going to find you. And when they find you, just keep doing your thing. Don't worry about anything else. Uh, the competition, there is no competition. And when you're, you become part of this industry, I think a lot of people right away are, what, what is my competition? There is no competition. You want to kind of mirror some of the places that are already established. You know, we have our own way of doing things, but with the same core values. And if we can have the success that they've had here, uh, there's plenty of room for everybody in this industry. I feel like nobody cooks anymore. So, and every, every family has got kids and every kid is involved in extracurricular activity. So there's plenty to go around, but you kind of look at them as a model to say, okay, we can do what they did and be around as long as they have, we're, we're going to hit a home run and we're in the ballpark. So, uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, and we're just looking, you know, each day is a little bit of a whirlwind right now, but, uh, I feel like at 54 years old, I I'm kind of rejuvenated again because of the outcry of support we've received. And, uh, if this is a sign for us in the future, we're off to a terrific start. I'm so happy your wife and you connected and she brought you to our side of the river because what an asset you are to our state. Charlie, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to come in and, and try that delicious burger you were talking about and to catch up with you in person one day. Thank you. All women in New Jersey should have access to critical breast health services. And the Connie Dwyer Breast Cancer Foundation helps make this happen. Sarah Roberts, the director of the foundation, is here to tell us more. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for spearheading such an important cause and mission. Tell us all about the foundation. Uh, the foundation, the Connie Dwyer Breast Cancer Foundation was created so all women had access to critical uh, breast cancer health screenings, treatments, and follow-ups in the state of New Jersey. We didn't want any women to feel like they couldn't come and get a screening regardless of their ability to pay or insurance. Where are your locations? We have two breast centers. Uh, the first one is at St. Michael's uh, at Newark, and the second is at Trinitas Regional Medical Center in Elizabeth, New Jersey. We are uh, working with University Hospital as our partner. We're raising $1.5 million to build and deploy a full mobile mammography screening unit that will screen for breast cancer and for cervical cancer. That is so amazing and so important for everyone to have that access. What do you tell people that are afraid for to get those screenings because I'm hitting I hate to admit it I'm hitting that magic number <laughs> where I'm gonna have to start getting a mammogram every year and I, I have to admit I'm petrified you know what? I just had my mammogram and there's nothing to be afraid of. I think the new standard of care is to ensure that you're getting a 3D mammography and to make sure when you make your appointment that it is state of the art technology. And then sometimes women who have dense breasts will need an, uh, an ultrasound following that. But it's quick, somewhat painless, 
but um, they try to make it as pleasant as possible and it's needed. So you're doing preventative care, which will put you that far ahead of everyone else. And hey, if you have the mobile unit, you can go with a bunch of girlfriends, get it all done at the same time, make a day out of it, right? Get some lunch after. That's right. I feel like you can go with your friends, your community. You don't have the barrier of transportation. It comes to you. We have bilingual coordinators. We have everyone in the community to make it a little bit better. So bring a sister, bring your mom, bring a friend and just come out and get screened. I think equally as extraordinary as your mission is the foundation's namesake, Connie Dwyer. Tell us who Connie is. She has three daughters. They're all amazing. They're very involved in the organization. Um, Becky Morano is the president of the or organization, and um, she is a great leader in taking us to new heights. Connie's an amazing woman. She started this organization in her living room with a board of amazing women when she had breast cancer the first time. She's had survived breast cancer twice. And the first time she was sitting in her room getting chemo and realized that everyone around her didn't have the same access to top quality care as she did. So she really wanted to make sure that all women in New Jersey had access to breast health care. How did she go about doing that, raising money and getting people on board? She had an amazing board of women, and these women had annual galas and fundraised and opened the first center at St. Michael's in Newark. Um, they raised millions of dollars, and then they went on I, um, almost 10 years later to raise another $3 million to open the second center. And now we're, we're still continuing to bring that care to women in New Jersey through the mobile mammography unit that we're doing with University Hospital in Greater Newark. The foundation also has a grants program. What is that all about? We do have a grants program. We just started this uh, last year was our first full cycle. We offer two grant cycles per year and we are granting $100,000 a year to organizations in our communities that are helping women with breast cancer. So we wanna continue our reach throughout the state of New Jersey to ensure that all women are getting the support they need, the scre screenings they need, and they're having, they have access to care. We're a couple weeks away from Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What do you have plans for October? We're excited about October. We have our annual Embrace Hope Gala that'll be in the evening of October 20th at the Park Avenue Club in Florham Park, New Jersey, where we'll come together to celebrate a survivorship and all of our donors and our wonderful um, supporters. Who are you honoring at the gala this year? We are honoring Gary Haran, the recently retired CEO of Trinitas Regional Medical Center. Gary cares so much about the community, and yes, he is a very worthy honoree. You've also had some pretty big A-list honorees in your past, like Eli Manning. <laughs> He's a great supporter. Him and his wife, Abby Manning, are wonderful supporters who have known Connie and Bob Dwyer for many years, and he's done a lot for our organization. Before we wrap, Sarah, how did you get involved and why do you care so much about this cause? I care about breast cancer because of course, like everyone who cares about it, it affects someone in your family. And um, my grandmother is a survivor of breast cancer. And through that ordeal, I became very interested in the topic and the issue and meeting Connie is an inspiration. Her daughters are an inspiration. And I think it's very important to keep this organization going so all women in New Jersey can continue to get the breast care that they need. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on here. Where can people find out more about the Connie Dwyer Breast Cancer Foundation? Uh, you can learn more on our website. It's um, cdbcf.org or look for us on social media at cdbcfnj. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Next week on Your New Jersey. I really found that where I thrived and where I enjoyed working the most was when I was hands-on with people. You know, it, it it's so important to help people on their worst days. It, it makes the most difference when you have the best people there. East Hanover has never had a female police officer in its 95 year history. So how, what has she brought to the table that's so different? Community relations. I mean, a male can only go so far. I, I'm a police officer 28 years. I've been involved in numerous incidents and community affairs. And you really don't have that connection with a female, a male to female, especially when you talk to a victim of a violence. You know what I find really special about your walks and obviously we've known each other, worked together for many years, is that people that have had loved ones pass away from this disease 
five, 10, 20 years ago still engage in your walks? Unfortunately, they've passed and it's too late, but they want to stay connected to the cause because they want to make sure that families that come next have more options, have better care options. And of course, what we all want, which is one day a way to slow this disease down um, and cure it. My story is not unique. Yes, for me, it was being a part of a film, but for you, it could be about speaking up to get that promotion or speaking up to address that issue in a personal relationship or speaking up to create a new a new experience for yourself whatever the case may be when we learn to speak up and ask for what we want from a place of love and grace we're able to seize all the opportunities in our lives that are meant for us thank you for joining me on another episode of your new jersey i'm lisa marie faldo we'll see you back here next week